Lawrence Neal here and welcome back to highintensitybusiness.com. This is episode 306 and today's topic is really to focus on uh, a business journey and also a pivot, which is a, a kind of a teaser a hint as to what's to come. Today's guest is Mike Lepowski, founder of Pure Physique. Mike returns to the podcast, having been on the show was it a couple of years ago, I think, Mike, and we talked purely about bodybuilding today. And we're talking about something very different. We're talking about business, which I'm really excited to learn more because I think out of all of the um, high intensity trainings or practitioners or business owners, I think you guys made one of the biggest pivots and most exciting pivots last year. Um, so we'll be talking about that here. But before we get into all of that, as I said to you, I love doing these business profiles with guests. And I just wanted to start off by learning about the studio business in terms of the services you offer and things like that. Could you just give us an overview of that quickly? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm excited to be on here with you, Lawrence. I mean, it's it's great. As we were saying before, it's been two years since we last saw each other at REC. And uh, even since then, things have changed a lot because I remember when we had that discussion back then, uh, we were talking about how we had just started to franchise Pure Physique and how we were starting on that journey. And uh, well, how that journey has even transitioned a little since last year. Uh, but that being said, I mean, our our studios are all set up uh, very similarly to a lot of hit studios in the sense that we are we're doing 30 minute workouts. Um, I think the one difference between us and many others might be that we focus a lot more on group training versus one-on-one personal training. And more recently, because of the changes uh, due to COVID, you know, we transitioned to, to being even smaller groups. So we had, in our minds, officially cracked the code on si sort of uh, medium-sized groups, like groups of eight to 12 people training at the same time, uh, but while implementing just purely a hit style of training. And uh, then COVID hit. And then because of especially all the restrictions across New York, uh, obviously across the country, but most particularly in New York, we got hit pretty hard and, and gyms were one of the last businesses to open. Actually, we were the last business to open. And so we went back a little bit to our roots of still not necessarily being one-on-one -on -one personal training, but now we're sticking with groups that are no larger than four. So now we've kind of revised the model just slightly to just place the emphasis on four. The interesting thing, however, was that our franchises were already set up for that because we saw sort of the problems that we were having with the medium to large size groups. And we said, you know what, when you guys are running your businesses, this is, this is how it's going to be broken up. And we are only going to allow you to do four, maybe a maximum of five people training at the same time. Uh, all our studios are outfitted with Nautilus one equipment. Uh, we do implement dumbbells, we do implement cable systems, we use TRX. I mean, all that stuff is part of our program. And, you know, we also try to be very, how would you say, um, uh, unique in our approach to HIT in that we do not follow a standard protocol with regards to the, the one set to failure or even only just tacking on um, intensity variables at the end of sets. Uh, we really like to, to make our experience unique. So we change over to different training styles every two weeks. Um, we definitely integrate a lot of the things that, um, uh, like I said, in, in our circle would sort of be viewed from the, the outside, right? It's a little bit more of an outsider's perspective. Um, like, oh, that's a little bit different. Oh, is that necessary? But, you know, we like to blend the enjoyment aspect of it, as well as the novelty component for a lot of people. Um, and for us, we believe that that is part of what's helped us to be a lot more mainstream, especially in our environment where uh, you have a lot of orange theories and you have a lot of um, soul cycles and you have a lot of these, these trendy type brands. And we wanted to not necessarily be trendy like them, but trendy enough where people are like, you know what, this place is, is different. And obviously the workout itself is going to be different because, well, all high intensity training is different compared to anything else out there, but we definitely just take a very unique approach to it. Awesome. That was super, super cool. So let me just dive into some of that. Um, 
So you mentioned different training styles. Can you elaborate on the kind of training styles that you would incorporate um, after you know every, in those sort of every two week cycles that you mentioned? Well, I'll give you a breakdown of what we're even just doing yeah. for uh, the current two weeks that we're in. So very much like uh, CrossFit likes to name their workouts of the week, we like to do the same thing. So we try to keep it interesting. We finished up uh, two weeks of doing what we call triple threat. Uh, this week we're into pump and pound. You know, we have a you know blast and burnout. And so with this week's, what we're doing is, you know, the first set of every exercise is done zone training style zone training in thirds. So we're taking people to or close to fatigue with that set, 20 second rest, and then into a 30 second full range of motion set, followed by another 20 second rest and another full range of motion, 30 second set. So it's, it's one in which we're, you know, just like the name implies, we're really focusing on that first set of just getting people a really good pump, getting that deep muscle fatigue, getting, you know, all that, that metabolic buildup inside those muscles. And then the next two sets are strictly about breaking down the muscle fibers with that, that heavy set. And, uh, you know, it just gives it a different feel. I mean, I think we know that as long as people are going to fatigue, like that is always the, the end goal. And we always keep that as the end goal, but we'll just take different approaches to get there. So sounds like, I love this. So it sounds like, you know, you have these, these quirky names for each workout training style, um, which I think is a cool idea, but the important thing to recognize, it sounds like they're always under the sort of umbrella of evidence-based resistance training, right? Which, you know, is something that Luke and I have spoken about a lot and, and Luke's mentioned it numerous times where he said, you know, we, we understand based on the evidence that the, 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 things that we can do in, in strength training is actually really quite broad and will still deliver the same result, right? As long as it's safe and all of those things. So it sounds like if I'm not mistaken, that all of these different training styles that I use will always kind of, like you say, generate a certain amount of fatigue and that's the primary goal. Um, and they're all just slightly different utilizing that the novelty where you can, is that a kind of a fair assessment? I think it's a very fair assessment and the way that, one could also look at it is, you know, we like, we like how CrossFit, even though we obviously disagree with their approach, but, but we like how they've integrated, you know, a lot of novelty into, into what they offer. Um, but in the same sense, you know, I am totally 100% bought in to high intensity training, the way it was, was originally, originally developed and introduced to us. Um, and so, and also coming from that bodybuilding background where I recognize that there's a lot of people who do a lot of high volume and a lot of unique type of workouts and get excellent results. My focus has always been, how can I program things in a way that help me to keep hit at the foundation of what we do? Because it is truly the foundation of our business. Um, you know, some might look at what we do and say, well, that's, that's not hit. Others would be like, oh, it's hit, but it's just, it's different. And so I just like to see how I could take different things from different areas and blend them all together, come in, accomplish the goal that, you know, our clients are coming in to accomplish, do it in the way that I believe is most scientific and evidence-based, right? But it's all about the wrapping paper. <laughs> so, you know, the, the gift the that I want to hand people is, is the same today as it was when I began 22 years ago and first got introduced to, to high intensity training and started in a Nautilus facility. You know, it's the same gift, but I just want to put a little different wrapping paper on it so that, that people might, might view it differently who do not come from this background, because keep in mind, you know, the people who are showing up at our studios, and I think this goes for all of us, um, most of them do not come with any type of understanding around high intensity training. Most don't have an understanding of resistance training in general, and hardly any really truly understand exercise in general. So when you when you take all those things into consideration, I know that they're coming in and they're going to receive the best form of exercise they could possibly do. 
But I also know that in order to maintain them as a client, in order to keep them fully engaged in the process, I can't present it in a dogmatic way. And so that is really at the, at the core of what we do and why we do it the way we do it. Yeah. I think that's a great analogy. I think that was awesome. Okay. So what, um, I wanted to jump back to what you mentioned about groups. It's really interesting what you said. You started with eight to 12, COVID happened and you had to reduce this all four to five, but you were already seeing challenges with eight to 12. And I was going to say, have you had challenges with supervision? Have you had challenges with getting people to train with good form to muscular failure? Because I know that some of our colleagues will have much smaller groups exactly for that reason, because they struggle. Has that been true for you? And um, yeah, what were the reasons for, for reducing that down a bit before COVID or, or thinking about reducing it down? Yeah, great question. So as far as you know, the concern about whether or not people are going to be executing properly, or taking the exercises to fatigue, it wasn't much of an issue because I guess I should have also stated that in doing groups of eight to 12, we were maintaining a one to four ratio of trainer to trainees at all time. So the way that you might view it is we may have a, a group of 12 and we have one lead trainer. So that is the person who is the primary voice in the room. They are the one who are who's starting the clock, stopping the clock, um, giving the general direction. And then you have the other two trainers who you could call them floaters, right? Or assistant trainers who are manning an area. So they're manning an area and they have direct contact with three to four clients at any given time. So it wasn't really much of an issue. Um, it was very chaotic. I will say that. And that's why that was one of the reasons why when we, when we set it up for the franchises, we said, listen, guys, we're just going to have you maintain the one to four ratio and let's just keep it at that. And there will, there are still times where maybe we will, you know, boost it to six people. And, and if there's, you know, we'll bring in another trainer if that's the case um, to again, maintain the ratios. So for mm -hmm. us, Maintaining those ratios are very important. I mean, we again, we do not ever want to do anything in a way that's haphazard. We do not want this to be a CrossFit or a boot camp where you have one instructor standing in the middle of the room with yeah. 20 to 40 people and nobody's paying attention to what anybody's doing. I mean, we know that that is not productive exercise. Yeah. Yeah. That's super interesting. All right. So what about, um, okay. So you mentioned 30 minute sessions generally. Um, what, what are you, what are you, what's your sort of, um, pricing and packaging? Like what, what are you charging? What, what, what can people buy? Is it like one-on-one -on -one and group or can you elaborate there? Sure. So group is the primary uh, option for us. That's the primary option. And, uh, depending upon when somebody came in, uh, versus, uh, people who are coming in now when we made this transition to to scaling it back i mean the price point is usually around 32 to 40 40 dollars per group training session uh, so something in that range personal training is higher i mean that's typically in the uh 52 to 65 dollar range per training session okay got it cool um and you, you mentioned nautilus one and then you mentioned um, cables, dumbbells, TRX. Do you have any other interesting pieces of kit that people might want to hear about, or is that the, the crux of it? That's, that's the crux of it. I mean, I'll tell you that one of the most favorite pieces of equipment, um, in our studios though, is just a traditional sissy squat machine, you know, where the, the legs get locked in and, and you're having people lean back and we have them holding that, that dumbbell up top. I mean, there's a lot of uh, love-hate relationship around that particular exercise. Um, we do have one of the first uh, Nautilus hip thrust machines that had come out. So when Nautilus first introduced that, I mean, we were pretty much one of the first ones on the list. I still think we are the only ones in our area that have one. Um, and that's an excellent piece of equipment uh, just because it just so, does such a phenomenal job of targeting, targeting the hamstrings and glutes and, uh, you know, you see a lot of people doing that exercise in gyms with barbells and pads wrapped underneath and stuff. And, you know, we were doing it too. Um, maybe not to that extent for many people, but I think introducing that 
piece of equipment in particular into our studios has, has been awesome. It looks like with the Nautilus One, I suppose since you are, uh, there is obviously a, a well, I assume a long-term goal to continue to grow the franchise um, depending on what happens with, obviously with COVID and restrictions and lockdowns and such. And it, I suppose it's easier to have consistency if you can rely on a brand like Nautilus, right? Or Nautilus One in particular, rather than trying to source, you know, old school classic pieces and then trying to have consistency. It's really hard to achieve that. Is that something that you think about when you're expanding the business to ensure there's some consistency with machine access? I think it's really important, especially for any type of franchise or chain that you want to have that consistency. I mean, because of, of our location uh, relative to some of the, the other ones, um, meaning my, my personal training studio versus some of the others, um, you know, we're almost in like a triangle and we will at times have some clients who will go to one studio, but then also train at another. And I think that when you have instances like that, um, as a brand is growing, I think it's really important to have that level of consistency. You know, the way that I always said I wanted to view our brand was, I mean, for talking about franchises or chains, I wanted it to be not McDonald's, but more like a Roots Chris, right? Which is like a, a, a chain or a, a franchise brand of steakhouses. So higher class, right? But still, you know, every time you go into one, like what you're getting. So I do believe that's important. And, um, you know, I'm, I've never been one who is, I know everybody loves medics and it's like a sin to come on here and talk down about medics. I used it forever. I actually do love the equipment, but I never really saw that it, you know, the, the value of it compared to something like the Norlis piece. And for me, because of the way that we're structuring our workouts and the different variables we use, like it, it was just never a necessity for us Whereas I know that Nautilus One brand is going to be around for a long time and, you know, it's much easier. Yes, it's much easier to be able to acquire that equipment than MedEx or maybe even, you know, people are using some more obscure stuff such as uh, the old super slow system. And it does. It definitely plays into my thought process. It's quite expensive though, right? Nautilus One. Is it expensive there? What it is? Not extremely expensive. Okay. I think it's I think it's pretty fair for a about a twelve piece circuit. I mean, it's just right around uh, between fifty and uh, sixty thousand dollars. Mm-hmm. How much is that per machine? Sixty thousand. Uh, most of them will work out about five um, grand. Yeah, uh, a little bit less. A little, a little bit, bit less. less. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. I suppose that's. Yeah, I guess that's. I don't know. I was going to say reasonable. It's still a lot of money, but for what it is, I guess you're right. Um, I'm just thinking it's probably similar here, actually, in terms of the the price points for Nautilus in Europe. Cool. All right. Thank you for that, Mike. That was a really good way to get started. Um, always good to learn about you know what what other um, studio owners are doing um, in regard to the details of their business. And I know that the listeners find that interesting. So. Obviously, 2020 was quite interesting. So I guess to kick off this next part of the conversation, do you want to just talk about where you were in March 2020 with the business? And I'm assuming maybe pushing the franchise a bit more. And then obviously everything changed and you had to kind of pivot. Tell me tell me what was happening then, what the thought process was. Tell us that story. So when it hit, um, we felt like we were actually in a pretty strong position. Um, We were probably on the best upward trend that we had seen in years um, for our main studio. And then obviously the franchises as well. Uh, They were younger, but still on an, on an upward rise. And yeah, COVID hit and it did require us to make some changes really, really quick. Now I'll preface that with saying that I do believe that we were really blessed in many ways because prior to it hitting, we already had an online program in place. Now it wasn't extensive. Um, You know, we weren't doing a lot with it. For us, it was mainly a value add for many of our members. The way that we looked at it was we wanted to keep people on recurring packages, right? So, So monthly recurring revenue, but we also have a lot of members who 
because they travel for business, because they go away for the summer. Like we did not want to lose that revenue. So we built out a pretty extensive online program. Um, we utilize the train rise app. And so we had workouts built in and, you know, all the communication built into it. So when people were going away, we're like, listen, you do not have to stop your training. You can continue on. Uh, your payments are going to remain <laughs> as they are, but we're going to continue to work with you because we don't want you to lose any ground. And so many people accepted that they, you know, it became just part of our packaging. And so when COVID hit, the only thing that we really needed to change was to start to bring some live streamed workouts to the, to the table. Uh, because all of the, most of the workouts that we were doing with people were already built out in our system. And so we started doing the live stream workouts. We transitioned uh, nearly a hundred percent of our members onto it. You know, some were a little, little hesitant at first. Uh, some did not stick with it. We thought that when this thing hit, we were only going to be out for a few weeks initially. So it wasn't a big deal. Yeah. You know, we, people kept their payments going. Um, we said, listen, for this period of time, we're going to run these uh, online training sessions. We were doing them again in groups. So we were having one instructor. We would get a bunch of people coming on and that instructor would be just like we would in a normal, normal group setting in studio. Uh, they're checking form, they're coaching people through the workouts. And it was, it was working out pretty well. And the way we split it up is at the time, you know, many people did not have any weights at home. And especially soon after you could not get any dumbbells anywhere. So we had two offerings for people. We had, you know, a, a dumbbell path and a, a body weight path. So I ran a lot of the, the dumbbell based workouts. I had another instructor who was running the body weight ones. And so depending upon what somebody had, we would put them on one of those two tracks Smooth. and it would show up and that's how we did it. And so once we saw that this was not going to be just two weeks, this was not going to be just a month. That's when we had to make the big shift because then people were making the decision as to whether or not they wanted to stick with this. Can I Some pause saying, you? Can I? Because I just yeah, want sure. to, I've got so many questions on what you just said, and I know that if I leave you going, I'll forget them, or it will just be bad timing. <laughs> so, firstly, you mentioned about how you were kind of already doing some of this stuff before, right? And you already had an online presence. You already had online workouts that people could do when they went traveling, but they weren't supervised. It sounds like they would just be workouts that were recorded that people could just follow. Did you have problems with that in terms of adherence? Because I can imagine just so many people not doing the actual workouts. Great question. We did not find that we had too much trouble with it. And I think the only reason why is because it was being used for such a short period of time. So we had maybe only a few people who were gone for large stretches that we would just not see them for one or two months. And those were the individuals, though, who they would exercise with or without us. So whether we were there or they were coming to us, these are the type of people who, you know, they would, they'll do Peloton, right? They'll do something on their own. They don't, they don't feel like they necessarily need somebody there. So for those people, it was more about the programming. It was more about, they didn't have to think about what they were doing while they were on vacation. They could open up their app. The app would lead them through the workout and they could walk away. Or the person who's going on the business trip, who's only going to be there for three days and needs a workout while they're using the hotel gym, that person it's going to work for. Where adherence did come into question is when COVID hit. So now we were really getting tested on that point of, are people actually going to follow through and do this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we found that the people who were committed to showing up for the live streams, they did great. The people who couldn't make them, maybe because the timing didn't work or they just mentally couldn't get themselves there, the adherence was most certainly a lot more difficult until we learned how to how to refine even that process and have better communication with them 
which then led to, to greater adherence and where we are now with our online program. What were some of those key changes? Um, the biggest thing was really getting, getting consistent with messaging people. Mm-hmm. And the beauty, I think, of having things systematized is, I mean, and you know this, um, you know, you can have one message and you could blast it out to a lot of people and you can make it uh, sound as personalized as personal can be. And so we really put a lot of focus and emphasis on creating that messaging and programming it into our Trainerize system. Uh, but if somebody didn't have Trainerize, they could use something like Scipio, a text messaging system, yeah. but something that it's going to show up in front of somebody's face. Mm-hmm. And you know, knowing that, that we're w- working off of this one platform, this one app, for delivering workouts, for delivering our nutrition, and now for delivering our communication, uh, it it really it really solidified everything. So even though we did have something in place before, again, it wasn't as robust as it became over the course of the year. Okay, awesome. And it, that was called that's called Trainer Eyes, like Trainer Eyes. Is that right? I Z E at the end, right? I Z E. Yep. Cool. All right. We'll get that linked up in the show notes. That sounds like a really useful platform. Um, yeah, I've always been quite skeptical of um, do-it-yourself workouts. You know, I've, for, I used to have, well, I actually did, uh, when I first started Hit Business Membership, it was just a general membership, if you remember way back. Um, and it was like business, but also fitness. So if people just wanted to join and get like workouts and fitness advice and community, um, but then I niched down because I, I felt like I needed to be more focused, right? Um but I was always skeptical about like, you know, providing online videos of training and then people actually being able to, to replicate that to a high level of, of intensity. And, and as you say, adhere to it. Um, and, um, obviously you're always going to get a cohort of people who are like super motivated, but they tend to be like the minority perhaps. Um, maybe some of those people you described. So I've always been a bit, you know, cause there's lots of people at the moment trying to sell this opportunity to fitness professionals, to, you can build, you can generate a huge amount of income by um, having ma- maximum leverage, right? Like an online platform with just workouts, pre-recorded workouts, meal plans, et cetera. And, and I, I do think there's value in that, but um, I don't like it when those same individuals put down, oh, what are you doing wasting your time doing Zoom workouts? What are you doing wasting your time doing one-on-one training online? I'm like, hello, like supervised one-on-one or small group um, especially in the way we do exercise and high intensity training is massively valuable to people. And there's no, nothing, uh, you know, embarrassing about providing that it's just providing enormous value. So I have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder about that camp, if you will, even though I'm kind of part of it, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of it. Just, I don't think we should be putting down that kind of one-on-one supervised, you know, um, trading time for money kind of training service, if that makes sense. Um, so a bit of a rant there. I went off on one there. Um, but just No, but question. I think you bring Go up ahead. a good point. I think mm. you really bring up a good point, though. And, you know, when, when we looked at this, too, I mean, we the way that we viewed it, we felt that there's going to be people who absolutely 100% need that live workout. Mm. They need it because if mm. they don't show up to it, just like they – they don't show up to the studio, they're not going to do it. But then on the other side, you do have those who they'll do a replay or they'll, um, they'll let the app walk them through it. And that's the other thing too. Like we offer up all replays of the live sessions so that this way, those who are constrained because of family or work or what have you, um, but still will not come into a studio they still have an opportunity to watch and listen to an instructor coach, maybe not them specifically, but let's be honest, everybody makes the same mistakes, right? Everybody requires the same cues. You do this long enough and you could close your eyes and train somebody because you know what mistakes they're going to make on that particular exercise or using that particular piece of equipment because everybody does it. So if, if you're just reminding people of the things that they should be looking for, watching for, feeling, um, you know, sometimes that is good enough for a certain trainee. 
And so we want to integrate everything, all the pieces, as much as we can into our online systems so that, so that it is robust, so that people get exactly what they came for, but get it in the format that actually works and agrees with them. Yeah, I love I love that. It's like you're you're addressing both the different types of people's needs there in terms of those that will will follow up later and do the do the pre the recorded version um, and those that actually need that real time supervision. And I know that you want to I certainly want to let you continue in a moment to talk about kind of what happened next in your journey. But just before we get there, I'm just really curious when you were doing the supervised group. Um, I imagine that's quite difficult virtually, just because. If I'm training four people, I don't know how many you were doing in group. You can elaborate on that in a moment. But how are you able to, like, for instance, if, if well, maybe you're not doing this, but if you're doing like a, a set cadence, right? Let's say you're doing a slow 20 second negative and you're timing someone, if everyone's off, right? If everyone's not in the same place in that exercise, or well, maybe you can still do like a 20 second cadence, just assume everyone's kind of near the same point but um, i guess the question i have here is can you just elaborate on how you manage a group virtual workout again in the way we do it because we're not talking about one train of 50 clients here we're talking about small group done with you know real focus on form and things like that so can you just elaborate on how what were the kind of principles the the the, the methodology that you use as a trainer when delivering great workouts in that context i don't believe it differs much from what we would be doing in studio um, okay. because our instructors have been trained on how to work with a group of people you know even in that really large setting when we had eight to 12 people as i said you have one main instructor who's they're still keeping their head on a swivel they're still seeing everybody even though people might not need them right there next to them there might be another trainer nearby but our trainers have been trained on, you know, scanning, like scan the room, scan the, the trainees, uh, if you're training them online and look for it. Because we also know that just like in a gym setting, you're always going to have, let's just say it's a group of four. You're going to have two people that may, may exercise really, really well. Like they are, you know, they're, they're your studs or your studettes. Those are the people that they only need the little reminders. They're there because they, they need the encouragement. Um, they will train at a higher intensity level because you're standing there, but they don't need you to necessarily micromanage every aspect of every repetition. Then you have people, the other two people, one of which might be okay, and they need reminders. And then you might have one that actually requires a little more attention. And it's really no different when it comes to doing a Zoom workout with a group of people. Mm. You're gonna have the few who are who have been doing this for a while, right? They they understand, they've shown up enough where they know what the expectation is and now they're executing. And so you know that when you're scanning over them, that nine out of ten times, like they're doing it right, they just may need some subtle reminders. And then you might be focusing a little bit more attention on, you know, two or three people where the reminders are a little bit more constant and that's okay. I think that at the end of the day, you know, the main focus is, did you, did you provide a workout that this person could not have gotten on their own? Like, did you get them to work at an intensity level that they could not have gotten on their own? And so, I am not going to pretend that it's a perfect system. Um, I, I'm sure that some of our colleagues could point out many flaws in it. Right. Um, but at the same time, the workout is only one piece of the puzzle as far as I'm concerned and as far as our business is concerned. You know, it's not about just that workout. It's what people have shown up to get from us. Why are they there? Because most did not walk into our door or get on a phone with us because we do high intensity training. They came to get a result. Mm -hmm. And I know that the way that we train is going to be the most effective and efficient way of getting them that result. But at the same time, I recognize that, that it's only a piece of the overall puzzle. I mean, 
I know so many of us, our, our colleagues, the focus of their business is the workout. And it's, it's about building strength, right? And, it's the, and I am totally 100% on board. But I also have to stand back and say, okay, we're pure physique. So people are coming to pure physique for the physique part. <laughs> and, and I know that the workouts will satisfy the, that piece that we need. And then we, not, we need to put the rest of the emphasis on, on all the other stuff that's going to get them that physique that, they, that they're showing up for. So is that basically like nutrition, managing stress, sleep, recovery, those kinds of things in addition is what you're alluding 100%. to, right? Yeah. Cool. Interesting. Yeah, everyone wants to look like Mike, right? I don't know if it, we have more women than, than, than men. Most of them, your wife. Most of them want to look like my wife than me. But, um, but it's interesting because like, you know, that's also a great testament to what we do because, you know, my wife before, before she is the way everybody sees her now was 24 pounds heavier. Mm. And she started training at the studio. And it was, you know, again, I, I tell this story that she's the only client I ever broke my golden rule with, which was like never date a client. <laughs> so I, I broke my rule once. It worked out. I married her. And uh, the rest is history. But when she, when she began, you know, she was, she was 24 pounds heavier. And it's, it's been the same process with her. So what's great is that in our business, we do get to point to the fact that, listen, in the last, you know, 11 years um, that she's been in the business uh, or just before that, starting off as a client, she too, like me, has never trained more than two hours in an entire week. Okay. You know, like that's been it. And so now, especially for our client base, and I apologize if I'm getting a little off track, but like That's for our client base, that is probably 70% women who would like to look like Corey Beth. It's great to be able to say to them, look at this system we have in place. Show up two to three times a week, get your 30 minute workouts in, and then all the rest of the stuff that we have you do. And you're going to find yourself in a place where you're finally achieving some of the, the body goals that you, that you came for. Okay. But we know they're going to achieve a lot more than just that. Yeah. I love that. Um, that's the one caveat, right? You can date your clients so long as you marry them, right? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Get one I shot at that. it. I never knew that. I didn't know that she was a client of yours. That's really cool. Um, all right. So thank you for that. That was really helpful. Do you know what I'd love to see? I don't know if you have this because I know you have quite a lot of content, but what would be really great, and I understand if you can't do this, is if we could embed like a um, like a group workout example, like a studio version where you're in person, like live, and then a virtual version. Maybe that's a little bit more sensitive in the actual blog post so people can actually see how you do it. Because I love that you understand, like, look, there's going to be some challenges. It's not going to be not necessarily getting able to replicate everything you would be able to do in like a one-on-one, -on -one, for example. And that's okay. Cause we're going to do like 70% of it. And we're going to use these criteria to make sure people are going to get the most out of their workouts. So I don't know, have a think about that. And if you have anything in mind, just ping over to me later and we can, we can put it in the blog post. Okay. So getting back to what we were saying, you were saying how, um, obviously you kind of realize that this was going to continue for a while in terms of the restrictions and everything else. And so you had to kind of like evolve what you were doing. So I don't know if you remember exactly where you left off, but do you want to just continue from there? <laughs> yeah. So no, I actually do. What happened was, is that when, when we realized that none of us were coming back um, anytime soon, we, we had at that point had already paused all of, all of our clients' memberships. And some of them, so we had about a, a two to four week period of time where we were, we were, had no income, right? We had no revenue coming in. And uh, we were still though servicing these people on the online side. You know, we were sort of doing it in, in good faith, like, hey, just stick with us. We know a payment just went through. We didn't want them to ask for refunds or anything like that. And most of our clients we knew would, would not do that. Um, but we just we're doing what we felt was the right thing to do. You know, we felt that this is the right thing to do um, at this moment. Let's just provide this for them. 
we do it in good faith and they'll come back afterwards. And so when it got to that point though, probably in, oh, I would say it was like in the beginning of May, right? So this all hit at the end of March. April wound up pretty much being a wash, but a lot of people paid for for April, let's say, or, or yeah, paid for April. Now May starts and what we had to do was either A, have everybody just shut down their, their payments um, and apply what they had just paid towards a new, a brand new service, which was our online subscription, um, or just uh, cut it off, save that for when we come back, and then start this new subscription. And so, so basically in May, we began doing this brand new subscription service for members. And, and we ran with that, you know, and it was, it was working out pretty well because, you know, there, there is a lot of upside obviously to online in the sense that you know, we were only having to pay uh, some staff for running those online workouts and for helping to manage some of these members who we now were, were being coaches for, which is also a little bit of a shift in mindset, right? Most, yeah. most of us are trainers and we switched our focus from forget about being just a trainer. Like now you're here to be a coach. And that was a complete shift. And that has actually though carried on until now where that is our focus. It's no longer on just the training. It's, it's on coaching, um, which I'll elaborate on that in a little bit, but we switched everybody over to the subscription and some stayed, you know, some did not, you know, we had, we had a drop off in, in business. Some people were like, I I'm trying to do it. I just can't do this. Like I'll be back when, when the studio opens and they just totally like, that was it. They were gone. Um, and we know that COVID hit a lot of people emotionally differently. So some people shut down, others stepped up. And we put a lot of focus into those people who were stepping up. We're like, listen, guys, we're going to do our best to help you step up. We're going to be there, you know, every step of the way. Um, And so we were asking them to just meet us halfway, like put some trust in us. We're going to work this thing out. And, and we did, I think we, we really succeeded as a team in helping to reinvent our community. And that for us was huge. And that's been the part that that has been awesome, which we took out of this whole situation that for all intents and purposes was horrible. Yeah. We got, we got something really, really good out of it. And I not even said so much uh, at the end of the year that, you know, in some ways I'm actually, I was sad to see 2020 be over because all of those trials, right. All those tribulations, um, helped to, helped us to rebuild our business in a way that I am happy, more happy now than ever before with the state of our business and, and what we're doing and how we're approaching it and just our entire mindset around it. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess you've got to uh, also keep in mind that it's not over yet, right? So like 2021, I mean, it sounds like I mean, I could be wrong about this because I'm obviously I'm over in Ireland, Europe, um, and I don't know what exactly is happening across the states. I know it differs depending on the state, but um, I don't know what's going to happen in terms of like lockdowns and restrictions this year. What's going to happen in terms of vaccine rollout? And more importantly, what's going to happen as it relates to consumer fear? You know, a lot of people are just scared to come into studios, right? Um And so there is that to contend with. So it's like, I've been kind of saying to people on this podcast and just in conversation, I think you have to have the mindset of, right, this could be another really challenging year for those reasons. And I just need to be ready for that. And that's why I'm a big proponent of what you're doing, having some kind of online offering as well as a studio offering as well. Um, So that's my take on that. Uh, What's the state of things where you are at the moment? Is um, Is it kind of reopened fully or what's happening there? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, things have reopened. Um, I'm in New York. So depending upon the part of New York you're in, it's a little bit different. I'm just north of the city, which we have it a lot better than those in the city. In the city, 
a lot of places are still shut down. Restaurants are having a hard time uh, up by me. It's not, not as bad, but you're right. It's more about the consumer fear at this point. A lot of, you know, people just are, are uncertain. Um, I'm very thankful for the praise we've gotten publicly and, you know, from clients about the way that we've handled it, our procedures. I mean, making that transition to making those smaller groups. I mean, the, the cleaning is right after every single exercise. I mean, equipment's being wiped down and we program things so people wouldn't even end up at the same piece of equipment as somebody else until like about a three minute gap usually. Um, so that does give the instructor plenty of time to clean in between. Uh, and then just even our check-in procedures, like all these little things to really make even most concerned citizen feel really safe in our oh, facility um, mm -hmm. has been really helpful for us because the, the people who were most scared, who were like, again, give us 1% of your trust and let us earn the other 99%. Those people have come in with that 1% trust and we earn the 99% back within their first session. And they're the most vocal about telling other people who are scared that, hey, this is probably the safest place in our community. You know, yeah. it's probably the, the most sanitized, the cleanest. Um, so that has been very helpful from, from that, that standpoint. Yeah, I think that's really important how overt you were in your messaging around the safety element. I don't think... Maybe, maybe most people realize this, but but safety is right up the top of a lot of people's kind of totem pole of values, right? Um, with everything that's happened. I mean, safety was never really up there before, but now it is. And the more you can speak to that in your messaging um, across platforms, the the more likely those people are going to return. Um, just on the, during the last sort of 10 minutes that we've got together here, Mike, um, let's, so fast forwarding to now, now you're really online businesses in full swing. I had a look at all your stuff online or the stuff I could find in terms of your Facebook. And you've got these great squeeze pages where you've got funnels for um, giveaways. You've got, if, if it's like a, some kind of body blueprint or a free call with you or your team, can you talk about where you are now with the online business and what the strategy is there and how that's all going? So the strategy for online now is actually just our strategy in general, which is we are, are very focused on high ticket sales. Um, that is, okay. that is the primary thing that we're going after. Um, you know, I think that a lot of people, because of what happened throughout COVID, um, people's money mindset got really, um, really messed up uh, because you know you, you see clients of yours and uh, friends of yours and maybe even you yourself have been have been devastated financially. And so I think a lot of people, you know, started, started doing their offerings, especially online offerings, really cheap. Like they mm -hmm. undervalued themselves, not recognizing that there are still people out there who, who were not affected at all. And, and even if they were, for many of us, like our biggest pain points we will pay anything and do anything to get those pain points resolved. Yeah. And so this goes, this ties into what I was talking before about our shift from training or trainers to coaches. So we are 100% funneling people towards high ticket offerings where we're coming in to change everything for you. I mean, it's, it's not about, just losing the weight, right? It's not about just dropping the fat and building more muscle and looking more tone. It's like, what, what underlies all that? Like, why is achieving that so important to you? Um, what led you to where you are now where you're struggling with all of these, these things and you can't get control over them? Like, when you could come in and present somebody with a solution to that, number one, I think that your impact is much greater versus just simply providing them with, you know, a good, efficient workout. Um, they value it more and they have more skin in the game as well when they're coming in um, and, and really like putting their money where their mouth is. Mm. You know, they say that, that 
I want to do this. I want to do that. Well, all right, let's, let's put some real skin in the game and, and let's leverage that. Right. Because if we, if we get you to leverage the money that you put in, chances are you're going to have success. You're going to do much greater things than if it's, if it's something that's free or if it's something that you're just paying a little bit for. I mean, look so at what are, what the, are we, what are we talking about here? Two grand, five grand, 10 grand, like usually any, anything between for us, most of our offerings will start around 1500, um, and go to about 6,000. And, you know, usually those are for programs that run anywhere from, uh, three months to upwards of about six months. Mm-hmm. And so, at that, you know, with that price point, I mean, that for us was also one of the saving graces during COVID because yeah. when we made that transition to the subscription model, uh, it was lower priced because those clients were only accustomed to paying so much, right? Um, and our price points did not change significantly when we switched them from online, to, uh, from in studio to online. Um, but still, it wasn't, you know, as as much for some people. But what we did was during that time, we we also offered up a high ticket offering for a program that just Corey Beth was running. And it was specifically for women. And, you know, we ran this right in the midst of COVID. And we were getting women to come in and purchase at $3,000 price points for um, like an eight week program. And so we knew that, okay, this, this online thing, if we do it this way, if we really put the focus on, on how we can resolve more problems, give people the, the coaching that they really need outside of just their workouts or you know, helping them with their nutrition, we got something. And we had taken even some of those low subscription uh, uh, individuals and move them into this high ticket program. This is a really important point. These people had already paid for services from you, with you. So it's like, those are probably the easiest people to actually offer something that's higher value, higher ticket. Uh, I think a lot of people forget that. And it's like, they already have, they, they already trust you. You're already adding value to them. So they're going to be, okay, obviously is it could be quite a bit of a, a, a difference in the value, but so long as you're communicating the difference in terms of what they're getting and that the, the impact in terms of transformation, then that that's an obvious upsell, isn't it? Someone like that. It absolutely is. And for many of these people, I mean, they were, we didn't necessarily know it at the time, but they were seeking more opportunity to get closer to us, mm. to get more help from us. And, you know, we did not realize it at that time, because you think that because they are showing up for their workouts, right. Or they're, they're part of the group that they're getting what they need and not recognizing that, that, Oh no, there's, there's a need underneath the need. And that's the one that we have to really focus and tap into. So we carried that throughout COVID where it was like, okay, from, from a business standpoint, it's great because we're investing you know, a few more hours, maybe a, a week in coaching people, but the margins are a lot better, right? Because it, it just, it makes sense. Um, and so why stop doing that? Or, you know, why not start with that? Because oftentimes, I mean, what you're saying makes a ton of sense that people who already know you and trust you might be more likely to, to elevate. But then there is also that component of, you know, people's money mindset is very interesting. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Because we we saw that too when we got back in studio and we said we have to make these changes um, to best serve all of you and to keep the environment safe. But it's also going to mean for some of you that were grandfathered in at this, this lower rate, it's time that you come back, that you come up here. Mm-hmm. And when we introduced that to some people, they freaked. They were like, they knew that the value of the service was worth so much more but because in their mind they had only been paying x amount it was hard for them to to bridge that gap mm. and i think the the way that you know you can analogy that you could use here is 
let's just say you decided one day that you wanted to lease a Lamborghini for, for three years and you walk into that dealership and you walk in knowing that I, I don't really have the money to do this, but let's just see what they say. And what if they turned around and said, you know what, Lawrence, $300 a month, the Lamborghini's yours. You're going to be like, I could do that. I could do that. And so you go through your, your three years of paying $300 every single month. You get to drive around the car of your dreams. And then the lease is up. You bring it back in and they say, you ready to get into another one? And you go, yeah, I would love to. I love driving this Lamborghini for the last three years. You go, well, in review, you know, we recognize that the salesperson at that time made a mistake. That the Lamborghini is worth a lot more than $300 a month. So if you want to continue driving this, it's going to be $900 a month. And then all of a sudden you're like, maybe I don't need to drive a Lamborghini. And you walk away. You know the value, you knew the entire time the value was there. It was worth so much more, but you just can't get past that, that money mindset of, but I was paying this and now you're asking me to pay that. And it's even a better service, right? But we did see that with many, maybe like five, 10% of our, our members, but it's there, it exists. But what helped was having the people who came in knowing that they're paying the $900 from day one. And if they decide to re-up their lease, well, they, they might not have to re-up it that same higher rate, you may have another program for them that's just below that, that allows them to maintain and continue on, um, but is not as much. So I do like the idea of when bringing people in, bringing them in at a high price point versus bringing them in at a low price point and trying to upsell. I would rather have to downsell somebody on a program versus upselling them on one. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was an absolutely perfect analogy. I thought it was brilliant. I've never heard that before. That was great. Great way of explaining it. Um, Mike, this has been so much fun and um, I'd love to do another hour, but I know we both got other engagements we have to get to. Um, I just want to mention as well to everyone listening that that Mike is doing mentorship on the side to business owners who might be interested in, in what he's done in the online space. Um, and the franchise opportunity is still there for people who want to be who are interested in that. I know that's something you're still very involved in. Um, so do you want to just direct the listeners to the best place to contact you and find out more um, on, on the web there? Yeah, so anybody can email me directly at mikel at purephysique.com or you could go to purephysique.com uh, on Instagram as Mike underscore Lepowski. So you can find me there as well. Facebook is pretty easy. Um, but yeah, we're, we've been doing some mentorship. And then one of the things, you know, that, that COVID did do for us, which we really didn't consider before was when it hit, we actually, um, asked our franchise company if they could make two offerings. So we have this studio offering that for us, it also encompasses what we do online, but then we do have a online only franchise opportunity. For somebody which obviously comes with far less overhead than the than the in-studio option but it does give somebody an opportunity to come on and be a part of pure physique franchise and get the entire structure of what we do and have it from day one that's fantastic i love the fact that you've kind of merged the online stuff into that as well um I was going to say, oh yeah, I just want to say, I, I, you know, forgot to say it earlier, but just congratulations on what you've achieved in the last 12 months. It's just absolutely awesome. Um, like I've been raving on about what, what Luke has done and, and what his team have done at Discover Strength. Um, and I, I'm certainly not taking away from that achievement. They've done amazing things, but I'm also just really impressed with the, with what you guys have achieved as well. It's um, cause I'm sure there was a lot of challenge and some dark times along the way. Um, especially when you just, you know, paused everything and had like zero income that must've been really stressful. Um, but you, you've obviously done really well. Um, and for everyone listening, to find the blog post for this episode, uh, please go to highintensitybusiness.com and search for episode 306. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. 